I'd rather feeling black than African American. Africans don't even fuck with us. Today, Singapore is richer than its ex-colonizer, Great Britain. So when I hear people telling me today, oh, Africa is poor because of colonization, I'm like, please, let's move on from that. Yeah, but Africa ain't built no ship and came back over here and rescued one nigga since we left from Africa. Yeah, and Africans don't like us. They ain't our people, we niggas, slaves. How do Kenyans feel about black Americans. don't have culture, they, are, they have only adapted to, to other society. So they lost culture, mm. and that's why we... When we confront people, they get defensive, and, and people don't want to admit that. I do believe our ancestors participated in the, in the atrocities that caused our people to be taken into slavery. I'm As their bitter rivalry spans continents, wars have erupted between Black Americans and Africans. Propelled by political power struggles, Africa and America both wield propaganda and stereotypes to shape public perception about the other. Yet, beneath the surface, the shared blood of these sisters run deep. Black Americans, as if native to the Congo, protested the loss of Lumumba, and all continental Africans felt the pain of Malcolm X's assassination. Who do you believe is responsible for Malcolm X? The white yeah. power structure in America is behind it. Proving that, despite the nation's discord, these sisters find moments of reconciliation in the face of shared grief or crisis. So can Africa and Black America ever mend ties? Or are we fated to clash in a relentless struggle for identity and power? Let's get into it. First, Negro, African, colored, Afro-American, African-American, and Black are all ways that African-Americans have identified themselves in a united United States since forcibly landing on the American shores. African Americans constantly debate their identifications with Africa to appropriately categorize their socio-political position in the United States. In spite of differential opinions about appropriate identifiers, my central argument is that African Americans have always had a relationship with the African continent, though the relationship varies greatly among them. Considering that African Americans have never been a monolithic group, some identify strongly with their African heritage, while others like Academy Award winning actor Morgan Freeman who claim, I'm not African, I'm American, suggesting Africa is a part of a discarded past. However, even those who reject an overt connection with the continent still acknowledge their African ancestry in some way, shape, or form. For us to be able to recognize what started the ongoing issue between African people across the diaspora, we have to go back to our history when we first arrived in the American. Americas. Many people ask me, why do you always bring up history or slavery? Because it gives us the evidence we need to further understand the ongoing conflict. Remember, nothing is new under the sun. First point will be the integration of blacks into African society. Going back to the mid to late 1800s, the current president was trying to decide if he should move the enslaved population in America to a small colony in Africa, like the British did, sending its first group of immigrants from Jamaica to Sierra Leone. The Island swampy, unhealthy conditions resulted in a high death rate among the settlers, as well as the nation's representatives. The British governor allowed the immigrants to relocate to a safer area temporarily. Meanwhile, slavery in America was becoming increasingly dangerous for Europeans to participate in due to the amount of slave uprisings that happened in Jamaica, Haiti, and America. Many white people were beginning to fear that the maltreatment of their enslaved people had gone too far. They were beginning to become afraid that the slaves will revolt and no longer fear their masters out of survival instincts. Abolitionists of slavery were planning new ways to liberate more slaves and ultimately abolish the practice. At the same time, slaveholders in the South opposed having free blacks in their states as they believed that black people threatened the stability of their slave societies. Slaves were gradually freed in the North, although more slowly than generally realized. The former slaves and other free blacks suffered considerable social and legal discrimination. Some abolitionists, including distinguished blacks such as a shipbuilder called Kuf, believed that blacks should return to the African homeland as if it was all one ethnicity, despite many black people having been in the United States for generations. Kuf's dream was that free African Americans and freed 
slaves could establish a prosperous colony in Africa, one based on immigration and trade. In 1811, who founded the Friendly Society of Sierra Leone? As historian Donald R. Wright put it, Kouf hoped to send at least one vessel each year to Sierra Leone, transporting African-American settlers and goods to the colony and returning with marketable African products. However, Kouf died in 1817 and with him his project. Since his death, colonizers had to formulate a new project. They discussed sending enslaved Africans in America back to Africa to its brother colony. Liberia. Liberia is located on the Atlantic coast in West Africa and encompasses a territory of 43,000 square miles. The country shares its borders with Sierra Leone to the northwest, Guinea to the north, the Ivory Coast to the east. The country is rich in natural resources including iron, timber, and diamonds. In 1816, a group of white Americans founded the American Colonization Society to deal with the problem of the growing number of free blacks in the United States by resettling them to Africa. The resulting state of Liberia would become the second after Haiti, black republic in the world at that time. George Washington's nephew, Bushrod Washington, was one of the group's first presidents. Among supporters were Andrew Jackson and James Monroe, who would serve as president of the United States from 1817 to 1825. Monroe would reportedly call the colony Little America, and Liberia's capital would be named after him. Clay, the Kentucky statesman known as the Great Great Compromiser supported the society for seemingly pragmatic reasons, saying that because of the unconquerable prejudice resulting from their color, freed slaves never could amalgamate with the free whites of this country. Many Africans fought against this, but laws were placed in order to give freedom to slaves who chose to move to Africa sweeten in the deal. With the president and enough of its citizens in agreement about the enslaved Africans going back to Africa, they began to get funding and support from local white businesses and citizens in America. Some truly believed Africans in America would have a better chance at life. At a nation, they began developing to send Africans there and hopefully get Africans in Liberia to conform to American culture and accept Christianity. In 1819, the U.S. government gave the ACS $100,000 to under write a settlement in Africa. West Africa was proposed as the most logical destination. For one, it was nearest to America's east coast. For two, most of the estimated 60 million Africans sold into slavery between 1503 and the mid-1800s had come from West Africa. Once the colonizers of America gathered the funding to create this nation and ship these African Americans to Liberia, they wasted no time. The men married on and gathered up to 80 Africans on a ship called the Elizabeth which set sail from New York to Liberia. The ride over was perilous. The dangerous waters, the long ship ride to Africa, diseases, all three ACS agents and 22 of the immigrants were left dead of fever. The survivors were evacuated to Freetown and Liberia's neighbors were already facing their own colonization with the Portuguese. A Portuguese sailor, Pedro de Sintra, was one of the first to establish contact with the West African people as early as 1460 with the Spanish and the French coming into contact with them 200 years before that. Subsequent Portuguese explorers named Grand Cape Mount, Cape Mesarado, and Cape Palmas. They also named the area Costa da Pimenta or Grain Coast because of the abundance of Melueta pepper, which became desired in European cooking. As a consequence, most of the West African coast was explored in a period from 1415 into the 1600s. Meanwhile, in Liberia, the settlers found themselves in a region that was home to tribes speaking 20 some languages. The white settlers being conceited had an obsession with changing Liberia into a little America. This uncontrollable need for the white settlers to change the natives home and invite unwanted occupants to the land only brought rage to the natives. One man, Charleston Bailey, a Monrovia resident in his 80s whose great 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 grandparents immigrated from Georgia to Liberia, shares the history. The first Liberian Bailey's clear the plantations from the bush and cultivated native crops as well as American staples including rice, sweet potatoes, cassava, cabbage, 
and eggplant. Bailey's grandfather was killed in the settlers' early clashes with the locals. The tribes wanted settlers to go back to America, but the settlers conquered them and they eventually surrendered. The attitudes of the Americans settling in Liberia left a bad taste in the natives' mouth. By denying indigenous people the right to vote and relegating them to subservient roles, field hands, house servants, and in some cases, forced laborers, natives deemed the Americans white and black as colonizers of the land. On July 26, 1847, the ACS announced that Commonwealth of Liberia, a colony founded and controlled by the private American Colonization Society, was now an independent state known as the Republic of Liberia. This was due to the fact that ACS had gone bankrupt. While they were first meant to take these recently enslaved Africans to Liberia, this turned out to be a complete failure due to the clashing of the two nations and the amount of pushback by Africans in America. The disconnect between Blacks and Africans. Africa's vast expanse, spanning 30 million square kilometers and encompassing 54 countries, reveals a diverse tapestry of unique dynamics. In locales such as Kenya, there is a warm embrace of African Americans. How do Kenyans view or feel about black Americans? I, I don't think we have much about black Americans because we are all black. Yeah, black Americans, they are like us. And maybe unless they talk, we, we don't even realize. Yeah, underlying tensions persist among diverse African groups and African Americans. As we navigate the complexities of the 21st century, conflicts have evolved beyond tools to nuance microaggressions. Ethnic slurs like Javir, Kafir, and Akata underscore the profound divisions originally sown by European or Arab colonizers, but later internalized within African community. This internal discord fuels animosity in Feeding economic opportunities and preventing African Americans from fully participating in Africa's current economic boom. Compounded by media driven misconceptions, African Americans may perceive Africans as backward, while African immigrants might view African Americans as lazy or violent. Amidst these challenges, internal schisms among African Americans regarding their own identity and terminology further complicates matters. Disputes over labels like Native American descendants of slavery or african-american obstruct unity adding an extra layer of complexity to establishing a shared identity to truly comprehend these intricacies it's vital to examine perspectives on the united states yeah nigga, fuck africa yeah they ain't, they ain't our people we niggas slaves the, the descendants of slaves they would never call no nigga. you said that uh africans no longer think about slavery whereas black Americans still blame the past. Right. African immigrants, often forming positive connections with white Americans pre-migration, find trust building easier. Conversely, African Americans molded by the legacies of slavery and racism approach whites with caution and may feel disdain towards African immigrants for expressing admiration for them. Different responses to adversity becomes apparent in this complex tapestry as well. African immigrants seeking economic upliftment steer clear of political agendas and assimilate seamlessly. In stark contrast, African Americans ensnared in a history of racism attribute problems to systematic issues and advocate fervently for civil rights. This complex relationship extends to the perceptions of African Americans' role in Liberia's history. Despite their significant contributions to Liberia's independence, they grapple with accusations of colonization, presenting a paradox given their historical ties and support for various African nations, adding to the feeling that Africans from the continent are hypercritical of African Americans for not trusting government officials or fully embracing American culture, leaving many Black Americans baffled since if it wasn't for the Portuguese, Spanish, Dutch, and British stealing from Africa, would we even have gold, ivory, peppers, oil, timber, and plenty more that's coming out of the continent daily? Black Americans are just pointing out that the exploitation for resources happened in America too. Transitioning to the broader picture. African Americans have always had strong ties with African countries. They've been actively involved in fighting against oppression everywhere, from rallying for Palestine to supporting Ghana after Nkrumah's passing and standing up against the atrocities in the Congo during King Leopold's time and now with Starbucks. When we say in order for 
Congo to be free, Palestine needs to be free in order for Palestine. Like it's yeah. because this it is the same culprit. So there is currently a very deadly genocide for power and control over Eastern Congo, an area that is widely rich in minerals. Um, the M23, which is a rebel group, has been responsible for these killings. Flying planes filled with bombs, dropping these bombs on African villages, were destroying women, were destroying children, were destroying babies. You never heard any outcry over here about that. As I have children in Uganda that I take care of, they eat because of me. I'm building homes in Uganda. So if you go on my page, you will be able to see um, at least maybe 600 videos of my babies. Africans selling Africans. My next point is that African Americans often lack awareness of the rich tapestry of African cultures. Instead, some may focus on specific kingdoms like Dahomey as evidence of Africans supposedly turning their back on us. It's crucial to recognize that Africa boasts over 3,000 kingdoms, each with numerous diverse groups within them. Like the Romans or the Samurai in Japan, there were some African kingdoms with the warrior spirit in the same way England, Scotland, Ireland, Japan, China, Korea, etc. have seen each other as rivals, Yoruba, Igbo, Dahomey, Ashanti, Fonse, Ga, or any of the other hundreds of West African ethnic groups didn't see themselves as fellow black people. A lot of them were rival nations, kingdoms, or empires, often warring against each other. These nations actively participated in aiding in European nations by capturing African prisoners of war, viewing it as a strategy to safeguard their own nations and maintain power. Many of these groups, accustomed to the realities of warfare, saw nothing amiss in exchanging prisoners for the security of their people. During that era, such actions were often perceived as a victory for the reigning monarchs monarchs, essential for the preservation of their nations in a time of ongoing conflict. An example is the Igbo ethnic group in Nigeria, renowned for their merchant skills in trading goods like tobacco and palm produce. However, in historical context, they were also involved in the sale of humans. Slaves were traded through the ports of Calabar and Bani in the southern region of present-day Nigeria. Ethnic groups along the coast such as Efik and Ija often acted as the middleman for Igbo traders. The British seeking to exploit this trade manipulated these groups by offering enticing goods. Slavery was so ingrained in Igbo culture that there are many African proverbs which reference to it. One being, anyone who has no slave is his own slave. Two, a slave who looks on while a fellow slave is tied up and thrown into the grave with his master should realize that the same thing could be done to him someday. This is why many African Americans move with apprehension around continental Africans, believing that many Africans aided in the selling of their own. Pan-Africanism and African unity. Even with the ongoing conflict throughout history, Black Americans have consistently demonstrated solidarity with various African nations, exemplified in their support for the Congo, Libya, Ghana, and others, highlighting the commonalities in our struggles. This solidarity aligns with the movements against slavery, segregation, and the super-exploitation in the West coinciding historically with the resistance movements on the African continent. The post-World War II era witnessed a surge in civil rights, human rights, and national independence movements in the United States and Africa. In the 1950, the rise of Gamal Abdel Nasser in Egypt inspired popular revolts in Iraq and Lebanon, reflecting the anti-imperialist sentiment that echoed across the African continent. Ghana's attainment of independence in 1957 under the leadership of Kwame Nkrumah marked a significant milestone. Nkrumah, influenced by Pan-Africans and Marxists like W.E.B. Du Bois, invited African Americans to participate in Ghana's newfound freedom turning the nation into a hub for liberation struggles. In 1960, a significant development unfolded on both African continents and the U.S. 17 African countries gained independence from European colonialism while African American students engaged in nonviolent direct action against racial segregation. The convergence of these events underscored the interconnected struggles for justice and equality. However, Lumumba's government faced opposition, leading to its overthrow after a short period. Lumumba, held under house arrest by United Nations forces, was eventually kidnapped and executed in 1961. Arrest, ill-treatment, imprisonment, death. Such was the fate of Patrice Lumumba. 
and it has been the signal for violent reactions in many parts of the world. First in the United Nations itself, where a Security Council meeting was violently interrupted. Malcolm X, a prominent figure in the Nation of Islam at that time, denounced Lumumba's politically motivated assassination. These historical developments emphasize the intertwined nature of the struggles for liberation in Africa and the ongoing fight against racial injustice in the United States. The examples of solidarity and conflict between Black Americans and Africans on the continent have proven to be powerful and impactful. Figures like Malcolm X, Patrice Lumumba, Kwame Nkrumah posed a threat to American society because they symbolized the potential for Black Americans and Africans to come together to fight for a sovereign nation and will global influence. Encouraging more interactions between African Americans and Africans on a continent is crucial to dispelling propaganda and reinforcing the idea that both groups have the right to fight for sovereignty as nations. For those interested in more long-form videos like this one and exploring such topics remember to like comment and subscribe i love you guys and thank you so much for the growing support i appreciate each and every one of you and if you would like to continue supporting this channel click the link in my description box to support my amazon wish list or support my cash app while that's not obligated a like is always free i think of us as a family we're reciprocating energy i give you info you give me a like thank you guys and i'll see you in the next one Mwah.